Bunch I'm a terrible, of, I'm oh, a terrible oh, sword loser. Oh, I don't follow the rules. All the bearded guys need to lie. Yeah. There are rumors galore. I am so up and down on my emotions right now. Retain salad. Okay. Where there is smoke, there is always fire. Etc. 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 You don't do it. Been there, done that, and we'll get into it later. They know crap about hockey. Come on. Well, I laugh it off. I have no issue. Here's the thing, though. I have nothing to do. I'm okay with this deal. There was no other option. So now you have nothing. We already blew it. Win now, win now. It paid off. I, 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 I will eat my pants. Hey guys, it's two guys in Hockey Talk. I'm Pavel. And I'm Evan. How you doing, the cat? I'm doing great, except I can't believe you called me out of my vacation time in beautiful British Columbia to talk hockey. I thought we still had a week, so clearly I have to have a doc with my agent, which I don't have one, but well, just my I, wife. I, I, I got to be honest and tell you that I decided to delay this by two weeks to start so I could get my time away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's back. It's back, man. Hockey is back. Yeah, yeah. Training camp has begun. Players are starting to play. Rookies are getting out there. People are sharpening their skates, Ooh. getting their shape. I'm looking forward to a great and wild season. Evan, there's been so much going on. It's been a crazy and wild off season. Why don't you take us off with some of the craziness that took place this year with some of the signings, some of the news around the league. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, before we get to that, I just want to mention to everyone, thanks for joining in for our season three episode one podcast of this season we are excited we got some new guests coming in we're going to bring back the old guests that you guys love to argue and debate with because we know that they're probably smarter than us one of them could be smarter than both of our takes and our opinions you guys watch us purely for the entertainment value i think but uh, hey guys thanks for all three of you following us here at two guys in hockey talk and so we want you to like follow subscribe man do all those social media things and uh, we we're really looking forward to some exciting news we'll mention the guests each week i also would like pavel to mention to people be sure to follow us on our facebook page not just our wednesday live uh, because we are trying to keep you updated with things around junior hockey, U.S. hockey, uh, whether it's Europe, the Continental League, the NHL, the AHL, um, just things and happenings around the league, as well as you'll notice sometimes I like to throw up those vintage pictures, especially I'm the goalie guy. I got to love those vintage goalies. Hey, I, I put up the 1992 All-Star uh, Tournament, and that was pretty Ooh. fun to watch. That, that so. was yeah, so, but so yeah, no, we, we we appreciate it. We can't believe we're in season three now. It's crazy how it's uh, flown by. And thanks, mom, for tuning in again, as always. And uh, Jordan, if you're watching, of course, beard. Um, I did shave, um, but clearly we were off camera, so we just came right back. So I, naturally, I, I'm gonna have to find a day to trim this all off. So before we begin, I gotta say, you know, I've been working all summer trying to grow a beard here. Uh, this old guy, but uh, I decided that I'm going to start the show. I'm going to move this. Come NHL playoffs, I will grow my beard from beginning until the end and the Stanley Cup winner. And I want to say, last year, I ended saying Tampa Bay will win, but I also said they will become three-time. Woo! Three Ooh. times. Stanley Since Cup the winner. Islanders. This year, this year, this year, Tampa will win it again. Wow, that's a bold prediction there, Evan. That's a bold, bold prediction. Well, I, I, no one else is going to predict this early, so I predicted at the end as soon as they won. Um, you know you know why? I know we never planned this, Pavel, but the reason I think because they have elite superstars at forward, defense, and goal. And I think when you get all three of those, it's the perfect combination uh, for what we need. But we'll see. We got a whole... Well, I mean, in, in the famous immortal words of Nikita Kucherov, number one not bullshit, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, let's get going. Uh, why, why don't I start us off with uh, a little bit of news? So, guys, just so you know, the Europe leagues have got started. The Continental Hockey League, the KHL, which is considered the second 
best league in the world um with the khl it's it's very different by the way there are some khl teams now playing in nhl sized rinks if you guys have not been familiar with that so but it's about the 2023 nhl draft when it comes there are two favorites Connor bedard of canada and michkov metev michkov of russia he is playing as a 16 year old young man in the AHL. He is playing, and now uh, you guys will notice uh, if you've been on our page, I posted in his second game, he had three points. So he had three points in two games, but I am going to tell you, he is a third line. He gets 15 to 16 minutes a game, doesn't get the power play uh, unless someone is down. Now, and it's just because the fact that he's a developing player, they, they want to promote him, but he has six games in and he still has only three points. So don't get too excited. He's kind of leveled out now. You know, maybe he'll pull up a few points here or there. But Michkov, man, 16-year-old playing with 24, 28-year-olds on a constant basis. And the guy is only five, I believe he's around 5'10", 175 pounds. As a little guy. So he reminds me, maybe not like he's a bit more skilled, but it reminds me of Rodi Anamirov, who was taken last year in the draft by the Toronto Maple Leafs, who was also, I believe, a 17-year-old or 18-year-old playing with men yeah. uh, in one of the leagues. So, you know, all the power to him. I'm excited. I know that there's been some rumors and whispers about this being the next Bedard and um, Mikoff as being the next Ovechkin and Crosby, which, of course, you know, would be exciting to see. I mean, those two in them in themselves uh, did some incredible things for the game of hockey and, you know, watching them compete back to back always has been fun. So I'm looking forward to it. It's going to yeah. be, uh, going to be a great draft in 2023, but let's focus on what's happening now. Okay. In the upcoming 2021 season. So we finished last year and there was a lot going on around Evander Kane. Update us. Well, uh, the league is still investigating some of the, tweets that I believe his um, now ex-wife um, posted on Instagram um, because apparently she made um, allegations that he had been betting on some of the games that he was playing uh, within with the Sharks, uh, San Jose Sharks. And so I know there's still, there's no resolution yet, so they're still investigating, but they're going to have to wrap it up soon because he was one of their best players last year in San Jose. And with what we know about the Pacific Division being kind of up in the air and like no favorites besides maybe Vegas and, you know, a little bit to Edmonton, there's really, it's a wild, wild west over there. So, you know, if San Jose wants to be a playoff team and, you know, you've heard comments from Eric Carlson and Brett Burns saying that we can do it, we can make the playoffs and they made some off season changes, yeah. you know, it definitely would um, help having Evander King kind of free and clear of that. That being said, there is some tension within the room. What room doesn't have tension, right? So here's something interesting, though. The reports are coming out, though, that the police have made reports that he had actually filed for uh, domestic abuse um, previous to these calls. Uh, and I've always kind of wondered, you know, as, as I always say, where there's smoke, there's got to be fire. And uh, I think that, you know, not disregarding the betting, because we know that he had had a huge debt in gambling. And again, this is really his personal life and outside of none of our business, other than if you're betting on hockey. The reason, yeah. folks, we are talking about because P. Rose was taken out of the Hall of Fame because of betting on baseball. That yeah. is just something you cannot bet on your own sport, let alone the accusations on your own team. So, but his wife looks like she has been vengeful. Who knows what's true and not true? But guys, we will keep you up to date. But like Pavel said, uh, this needs to be settled soon. And what I heard from Frank Cervelli is that they are not Frank Cervelli, sorry, John Shannon of Sportsnet. Uh, he said that they're no closer to finding anything on this follow-up case with the NHL. And I wonder if he just gets back at it and they just move on and get the season started. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we'll see what takes place. I, I wish nothing but the best for Evander Kane. It's never easy to be in that situation and position, especially because it can affect and influence a lot of parts of your life, right? And it's, it's tough to work with colleagues who may not be in the best mindset or frame of mind, you know. So we wish them the best. We wish the NHL the best. And we wish the San Jose Sharks the best because they are electric and dynamite when they can play. And they have got a, 
a great, great back end there, and they've made some good offseason moves, and Doug Wilson still believes in this court, so, you know, and we'll see how it goes. But moving on. So training camps have opened up. Rookies yes. start this week. Last week was a lot of Campton skates, captain skates, which are the informal skates that are organized by the captain of their respective teams. Uh, I'm not sure. I never heard if there were some captains that never showed up, but the team did. That would be an interesting story. <laughs> who, who goes then if it's not, if there's no captain on a team like Ottawa Senators? <laughs> organized. Yeah, well, you know what? Maybe we should do a deep dive this week and look into our multiple sources, which we obviously have. And uh, we got, but so if you're out there and you're a fandom of the Ottawa Senators, we want you to be our insider. We hire you. Send us some news over at Two Guys in Hockey Talk. Uh, yeah, no idea who, uh, if they call it a captain skate still, or did they just call it a team skate, informal team skate? So, anyway, yeah, so the rookies are this week, and then next week, uh, the actual training camps begin for the NHL. So, this is going to be exciting. Which takes us now to there's some people going into Camp Pavel that do not have contracts. So yeah. we, we know right in the hometown there of Edmonton, we got Yamamoto, who yeah. now we're going to start on a really low end. We won't take much time on him, uh, but he, he's going to camp. People thought this was going to be done and sealed and already put aside. There's talk that it could be because of the LTIR with Clef Bomb. Are they just holding off? Is because he wants more money? Is he holding out? And should he hold out? He's an RFA. Had a bad last season, 20 plus games, five goals only, uh, 30 games, something like that. Um, what, 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 what have you heard? Um, so I've heard that um, the Oilers group has reached out to Yamamoto and offered him potentially a two year at 1.5. Will he accept that? Will he, um, you know, decline that? Will it remains to be seen. Um, I, I have a feeling that Ken Holland will get it done just before them. Um, Edmonton, in terms of their depth up front, is pretty solid. You know, they've got a few things. I mean, it was announced today that uh, Dylan Holloway is going to have some surgery, you know, and that's another guy that they thought that maybe come out to camp and prove some people wrong and, you know, be able to make his way into the lineup. Who knows? That being said, Yamamoto had an off year, but he is scrappy, he is fast, he is tenacious, and I don't see why the Oilers would want to let go of someone like that since he has so much potential and a higher ceiling. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of players in the last season or the last um, shortened season that have had down years and they're ready to break out. So I feel like Yamamoto is in for it and he can really perform, especially when you play with someone like Leon Dreisaitl and Ryan Nugent Hopkins. So. And that's what worries me, though, when, when a player, no matter how good he is, can play with those two top centers, uh, Connor McDavid or Jaisa, and still not produce. I mean, he was snake bitten. He had a wrist injury that people, not a lot of people were aware of. Um, I'm hearing that his camp is coming in around 2.25 or 2.3 trying to bring in and that there is a negotiation. I've heard that from two, three different groups. Um, it makes me wonder if we come in maybe at a 1.75, but I know local in Edmonton Oilers now, Bob Stoffer thinks it's going to, they're going to hold to their guns and they're going to offer him a 1.5. And if he only wants to take a one year, it might be less than 1.5. So that'll be interesting. Well, let's hit someone really interesting in who is an RFA coming up, Brady Kachuk. Yes. This is, I, I am astounded at what I'm hearing for numbers. So <laughs> right now, I'm hearing Brady Kachuk, eight years, eight, eight plus million dollars a year. Yeah, that's, that's the rumor. Now. I have a problem with this number. Okay. What, what's your, what's your thought on this? Well, I need to, I need to rebuttal you. So show me why you believe that's wrong. Well, number one, what, what, what is his points per game? So he is a goal scorer. I think we can agree on that. So, yeah. but it's, they're, they're signing him. We're going to talk about this with some other contracts because that's what we're talking about today. Yeah. I am bothered by the NHL and the kind of contracts they hand out. These owners, they keep crying that they have no money and they compete against each other. And they, they just keep handing money out like it's free. And then they want the salary cap to go up. But then they complain because some of the owners, they're going to have to share the money because they have to get up to the cap floor. 
So a group like Ottawa is taking money from other teams in the equalization because they need some extra cash flow because they're not bringing in the extra cash flow. They're one of those teams just recently. They're barely getting to the cap flow and they're overpaying for players. No different yeah. than Florida, overpaying for players. So here's my thing. You're paying for potential for Brady. Yeah. You're paying for potential. But $8 million, this guy may never be more than a 0. 0.75 points per game player. He had a great last season, but you don't know he's going to get better. And to sign that long, I think you hold your guns and push him on a bridge level. And you say, you know what? Let's do two years at, at 6.75 or 7 million. And then let him even earn nine to 10 if he's really that good. But I don't think he's that good. And I don't think he's ever going to be a point per game player. And 8 million tying up is going to handcuff that team if he doesn't produce. Fair, fair. I mean, the problem is, is that you're paying for the potential. You're paying for a potential captain of this franchise, a star player that brings in you revenue in other ways, whether it's jerseys, marketing, whatever it may be. You need yes. a face of the franchise. The other thing that Ottawa has always had an issue with is that they have uh, they have never wanted to keep players long term and they've never wanted to overpay. We all know Eugene Melnick and kind of the history of him being as cheap as possible and trying to stifle every dollar there, right? He's not going to come on our show if you keep calling him cheap. I've been trying to get him on for the last two seasons. <laughs> and, you know, Pierre Dorian just got an extension. Thomas Shabbat was done, I believe, last year. You know, and, you know, they believe in their young core and they have a lot of potential. The other thing is they're thinking future-wise, just like they did here in Edmonton and a few other places that, you know, what could be uh, when they started Darnell Nurse is that he has the potential to be bigger and, of course, um, the cap should go up. That is that is the intent. You know, whatever we think of the pandemic, it should be. We're we're slowly getting back to normal, and people are going to start attending games more. You know, we saw fans last season in, in the states, and Canada yeah. is probably slowly right behind. So you're bringing in that extra revenue. You believe in the potential of a guy who can penalty kill, power play. Um, he, I believe he was a twenty plus goal. Um, 20 goals plus last season. So like he really, really took that next step or 17 goals. I think it was maybe we'll have to look it up. You guys can let us know down in the comments, but he's a solid young player. He's got size. He's got grit. He will fight. And honestly, the hotter take that I would have is I would take Brady Kachuk in my team over Matthew Kachuk. That is how much I believe in Brady Kachuk in terms of his potential and nothing against Matthew Kachuk. I think he's an unreal player. That whole family, very gifted, very talented. But I like what I see from Brady Kachuk, and he may be the face and the franchise and the captain of that team. He's got size, grit. He's only going to get better. And once he starts getting some other players around him that play much better, like a Tim Stutzla, you know, taking that next step in development, he's going to be good. And I think 8x8 eight eight isn't that much for a guy who has a lot of opportunity because he could take a bridge deal for yeah. let's say two to three years at 11 million and then ask for 11, a he's gonna for pay 11 million for a guy that can't produce more than uh like 0. 0.6 points per game i'm just saying you you just said yourself that these these owners are spending like crazy so oh, I, agree. I agree I, I, I agree with the owners <laughs> yeah so i mean i'm not saying i would do it i'm just saying that if this is what they believe in also, you want to keep players, you know, you want to invest in people and you want to say, this is a good place to have a long-term career. Yeah, but man, three years. So he gets 45 in year one and 71 games, 44 in second year and 71 games. This year, pro-rated, um, he would have approximately in the 71 games, he would have came in to about 48 points. So you're dealing with, and, and so let's, if you points per game over an 82 point season for what he, this last year he produced just a tad bit more, um, but you, you are taking such a chance on a guy that right now is say a 25, 26 goal scorer and, and going to produce you about 55 to 60 points for $8 million just because you hope you can build around this guy. Is that not how teams go to die in the graveyards? Maybe. We'll see. I mean, it, you know, in hindsight, everything is much easier to see. I think I think it, they're taking a gamble, a good gamble, because they picked him up. They got a lot of prospects from Carlson, 
when they traded him. Uh, I don't believe he was one of them, but I mean, they were rebuilding. And I know Pierre Dorian said the rebuild is done and that they're ready to compete, which I think they still need a little bit more work and a little bit of tweaking. We'll see how this year goes. And it's a tough division they're in. They, they got but, some good players there with Josh Norris and they got, yeah. uh, I'm trying to remember uh, Shane, Shane Pento. I can't remember that. You got a good draft coming in. They yeah, got Connor Brown. Um, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, and, and you know what? And you brought up a good point on that cap going up. Though just recently, Frank Saravelli, I, j- I just heard news two days ago. He's talking about because the escrow is going to be pulled in in the next couple of years, that okay. you are only looking at over a four-year period as much as they were hoping because the escrow getting used up, they're looking at half million to a million a year only going up. So that the teams are going to have to be careful. And I know you were talking about the contracts and the value. We're going to come to nurse and some of those defenseman contracts. But mentioning that, let's talk about another guy who is a defenseman coming in and to sign. And I haven't heard numbers yet. Rasmus Dahlin. Oh, yes. The one overall draft pick, Buffalo Sabres. They're a mess, but they need them. This is yeah. a and we, we, we know we're dealing with in the $9 million range for some of these younger guys or these older and younger defensemen right now. What do you honestly or have you heard anything uh, in any rumors on Darlene's numbers? Nothing. It's, it's been mums the word or hush around Buffalo, right? I mean, they, I mean, the big saga right now there is Jack Eichel and will he, won't he even show up to camp? So that cloud is going to hang over Buffalo until it gets resolved one way or another, whether he gets moved, gets the surgery stays. I don't know. I don't even know if he's going to come to camp and be asked to perform because they'll say, well, according to our doctors, according to our physicians and our training staff, you are good to play. And Eichel can just do similar to maybe not sit out, but, you know, um, you know, play like uh, Dubois did, you know, in Columbus, and he kind of just half-assed it where Tortola had to sit him. So, it, so is it Darlene, definitely is. Is Darlene going to come to camp? He's an RFA this year, and there's no contract in place. I don't know. There's a lot of guys. I mean, we, we can wait a week and see what takes place, and maybe it happens tonight. I mean, we can, you know, speak unknowns, and then tonight all of a sudden he's signed and it's all done. My inkling is that they're going to do a bridge deal with him just because I don't know if they consider him as part of the future plans, given that they're rebuilding the the old rebuilds. I think they may do a two to three year deal, see what, what, what's possible and then revisit in a few years, you know, because who knows, maybe they're, maybe they're going to try to go for Shane right next year. Well, he's about a point four eight. Last year, his sophomore was great. Um, As a defense. So I, I, I will. I do want to compare him a little while in the, in a bit when we talk about contracts for some of those other big boys that just signed those big contracts. His points and his defense is coming around the same kind of. But uh, but then the question is, who did he play with? Was it was it uh, called Resbris the line in that he played with on the other line? Like was that like who was his mentor there? Right. He didn't really have someone to like take him under the reins. Like he's a young defenseman who needed like a veteran to teach him. You know, you had Sergachev in yeah. uh, who came over from Montreal to Tampa and you have headmen, right? And you have um so, uh, what's so you're this right. It was either Colin Miller or Risto Ristolanian. Yeah. Who are defensive um, abilities sometimes. What's his name? Uh that went over to um Brandon Montour, right? So, you know. So you don't really have anyone that like can stay with you, a veteran guy who can lead you, right? Even if they're not point producing, they, they can teach you the ropes, right? Bridge them, I think if you could bridge them in between five and six million somewhere for two years, if they really get a good feel of what you got. Yeah, I think, yeah. But I, I have a feeling it's going to be over seven on a bridge even. That's just my take. Okay, guys. Well, let, let's move on to someone who's totally interesting. Talking about the KHL, the rumor has been now – quashed that there is a KHL team after Kaprizov, the rookie oh. of the year last year, and how much money. So let, let, let's let talk about him. Get, get, give, give us something on this one. So it looks like it's going to come in at five years around, I believe, um, $9 million. That's kind of what, what they're looking at. Um, I know that uh, Kaprizov's camp wanted shorter. I never believed he wanted to go to the KHL. 
because you don't go to the NHL for a year unless something dire happened with Minnesota that he didn't want to play there. But he seemed like he was enjoying himself. That team took a big step forward with what they had. And, I mean, they were missing some of their young key guys. Marco Rossi, if he played with him, oh, what a dynamite, explosive uh, team that would be then. So I think he's done a lot of the work where he's really played – Bill Guerin and took in his time. That being said, Bill Guerin is a very patient man and he will make it work. You know, he prepared for all avenues and outlets. So media can speculate all they want. Kaprizov was going to be a Minnesota wild, no matter what. Now that being said in five years, I can't say where he would be because he may want to win, but. But think of it a 55, 55 game sample. So, so he's just under a point per game. On only a 55 game and to put out that kind of money. Oh, and 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 what the heck? We'll talk about this another time. What the heck did Bill Guerin do? He's building a great team and he's just lost what 10 to 12 million a year in cap space. Yeah, that was a definitely kind of a questionable move. Um, I definitely didn't see why you would get rid of both Suter no. and Jose, but We're, I mean this- all the Grizzly made sense because we talked about that off season, right? Yeah. About the, the injuries, but you know, Suter is still going to give you that second line minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, they're going to thrive in the new teams that they play for, you know, for the Islanders. So, you know, it's, and I believe Suter went to Dallas, if I recall, Yeah, you guys confirm it. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know what they're doing, but Whoa. at the same time, if you're in Minnesota, you want to, if you saw this guy leave, you would not be very, very happy. No. He is a Calder winner. He is exciting. And I think um, Elias Pedersen more so, his camp is looking at what's happening with Kaprizov before he signs, because I think that's where he's taking these cues. Because like, if you think that, you know, this guy's worth this, yeah, he's my equivalent, and I'm a center, versus, you know, Kaprizov, I believe, is a winger. So. I believe so. Um, where we go. Yeah, he's a left or a right. He can play both sides, but he's yeah. a left. So yeah, so which brings up a, a good point. And I was gonna say, Kaprizov, you're right. The fans there are are like they are in love with Kaprizov. And I mean, just his enigma, his charisma that he brings to the team. Minnesota, and you guys, fans of Minnesota, you guys deserve a player like that. Yeah. It's been a while, and I tell you, it makes it more exciting when he's playing other teams because now they're excited to see Minnesota play with the yeah. team that they're assembling. So good on them, you know, with that. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to say if he can continue what he's doing, not a problem. If he can be that point per game player and that thrilling. Um, but I don't think there's been another player like him in Minnesota since Mike Mandano. Yeah. They have not had, I got all the other guys that have been there. They've had some good players, but what he brings to that team and, and just how he, he flash this that Yeah. Oh, it's great. It's, it's what makes hockey exciting. So yeah. you brought it up. Let's quickly, uh, let, let's take about two minutes, three minutes in Vancouver because we yeah. got Elias Patterson and Quinn Hughes that uh, we need to really look at because they don't have a lot of cap space. I think they have about 11 million left for those two players. To split <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, knowing the numbers, so we were talking, we're not going to talk about the other guys yet, about defensemen. We know that uh, Quinn Hughes is going to be looking at a car kind of money, probably. Yes. Yeah, uh, and and uh, I believe it is Heisken, Miro Heiskanen out in Dallas. Yeah. He also resigned. Okay, okay. I, I got to quickly look that up while you're chatting here. I'm going to go look that up for you guys right now. Um, but, yeah, so we, with mentioning that, um, they're going to have to do something, but what are they going to be? So if Pedersen comes in and says, you know, I, if I do a bridge deal, I still want a lot of money. There's no way they're bringing both those guys in, even on bridge contracts for five and a half million dollars. They got to move something out. And so what, what's your best take or what you think is going to happen based on what you're seeing? So, so first thing I want to say is that there's been some rumors or potential aura of the notion of an offer sheet for Pedersen, right? Because, you know, we had the one for Kakanyami and, you know, and I know that Vancouver was watching that situation very closely. And so they were worried because, of course, Pedersen, young center, Swedish, very talented, a lot of upside, of course, injured last year for most of the season. So didn't really play. Um, that being said, I think they're closer with Hughes than they are with Pedersen. 
I think with Hughes, it's going to be more of a bridge deal, a three to four year deal kind of, you know, set him in, you know, and he had a good year, but not the best year. I think it was a little bit of a regression. That being said, he was being put up in top minutes, you know, and playing with, you know, whether it was Edler or Myers, um, you know, it was, it was a lot to take on. And I think that he's going to benefit, you know, um, from taking that next step this year and be able to kind of, you know, subdue his number or better uh, subdue his expectations and better his play with Pedersen. It's, it's kind of hard because he made some comments this season and I, it's, it's hard to take comments, especially of your own language. And then you translate them because people read a lot into it, but he kind of talked about wanting to win and being in a winning culture, right? Now they brought in the Sedins to be advisors, which as we've talked about on the show in a previous uh, podcast, they may be the next, double gms as you believe it to be right okay i think they brought him in because of the history the connection the team and just getting a sense of the work there and i think they want to make Pedersen comfortable and happy and build a winning culture around him right and you and you heard horvad make the same comments too you know he didn't come here just to lose and last year they were i mean the whole COVID situation really brought him down I think Hughes will be done by next week. I'm not too sure about Pedersen. I think they can get it done, but I think it's a very wait and see. And I think as fans, we can get a little impatient because we expect business to be done very fast. That being said, contracts take a very long time to negotiate, to go through. Because there's bonuses, um, all these little uh, clauses that you have to include. So we, we'd love to have somebody who's a lawyer and has ever done a contract any kind on the show so they can explain the process and put everyone to sleep. <laughs> but, so that, that's what I think. I think they'll still be Vancouver fans. I was talking with an insider here in Kelowna who's a big fan and knows a little bit about the team and has been on the podcast daily. <laughs> and he was saying he doesn't feel too worried about it, but... You know, there is that, that sense of creeping in in the background, like, what if? So, but. Yeah. Well, and, uh, I mean, they have freed themselves of for Tannen money. He's gone over to the KHL with the yeah, issue yeah. and so forth for a year, you know, um, which is just on a, a side note. So, okay. Well, because we're mentioning on those things, uh, we, we, we could go into the talk on all the other contracts. So, we, we got about 20 minutes here to kind of go over – a couple things. So let's talk about uh, Kakakanemi. Uh, I always say his name wrong. Pavel. Kakakanemi. Kakakanemi. Okay. My, my finish is terrible, so I apologize. <laughs> so anyway, with Mr. K. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mr. KK. <laughs> Mr. KK. So anyway, in his case, uh, I want to kind of talk about what happened there. I'm not too much time because I want to focus on the contracts uh, that actually more focus on this and then go into about the hurricanes because you and I did have an off season. Then some things happened with Sveshnikov and, and stuff. Uh, and of course this uh, signing. And then I want us still to finish off and let's talk about the big contracts that were actually signed by RFAs and or UFAs uh, for the defensemen in the league. So, okay. So let's talk about this. Uh, Montreal, they make a big move. Not Montreal, sorry. Hurricanes make a big move. What did they do, man? I mean, Montreal did make a big move, right? They got Christian Dvorak. But um, so, you know, uh, Carolina did the offer sheet, which uh, finally panned out, and they actually got their player. And the last time that was successful was in 2017, I believe, when uh, Edmonton offer sheeted Dustin Penner from the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. And that's the last successful offer sheet. So good for Carolina. They went for the player that they wanted. You know, they like their young Finnish players. You know, you've got Teravine in there. You've got Ajo there. You know, they definitely, in my mind and opinion, made some questionable moves this offseason, especially with the goaltending, the Nedeljkovic. But they ended up offering a first and a third to get a KK for $6.1 million as a show-me one-year contract. And as early as January, they'll be able to start uh, talking contract extension and negotiations, which I think they will. And they're kind of going to go in a little bit lower between a 3.5 to 4.5 at a longer term, maybe a three, four, five year contract, depending on how he performs, because he literally only had 20 points last season. Uh, he had, I believe five goals and 15 assists and he was scratched in some of the playoff games this past season. So whether you agree with that or not, I mean, that's a, 
Dominic Ducharme question, you would have to ask him. But, you know, Carolina went for the player they went for. They paid a little extra. There was a little bit of pettiness and a little bit of, you know, getting back at Montreal for what they did to Ajo. But, you know, it is what it is. And people and say, well, there'll be no more, no more offer sheets. But I disagree. That, and that report's been denied by uh, Dundon saying that actually it was all in fun for their Twitter and their social media. Um, and, and I actually tend to agree with the owner that they weren't looking. They were just making fun of it, uh, not towards Montreal. But actually, because they had been trying to deal, do a deal with Montreal behind the back doors, like Burke was back in the day with Boston. And so they put that out there. They did their stuff and they are good at finding ways to keep central in the minds and the eyes of the public in Carolina. Yeah. Uh, Carolina is a good, solid team. They've performed very well in the last few years. They're always a, a, a playoff contending team. They're trying to get back to where they were in 2006, and they are pushing. And, you know, they Rob Brindamore will get the best out of all those players. They've picked up Ethan Bear from Edmonton with a trade. They got Tony D'Angelo, right, because he was bought out by the Rangers, and they brought him in. You know, they, they brought in... Um, Frederick Anderson over from uh, Toronto, you know, because Toronto wasn't going to resign him for that price. You know, the, the Nedeljkovic thing was very funny because I liked Nedeljkovic. You know, he was a, he was a Calder nominee. He was an excellent goaltender. Like he had a great season and he had a great playoff run. So to bring it in, you know, with Anderson, mm, I don't know if that's going to be better, but we'll see. And I think they're just going to continue to go for it. But that being said, I will agree, Evan, that they have one of the best, Twitter handlers or social media platforms or pages ever. They know how to play it up. Whether it was the bunch of jerks, whether it's the storm surge, whether it was like trolling people online, they know how to do it. Yeah. Well, so so here's my thing. You talked about the comparison with Dustin Penner. Back in the day, Dustin Penner, he'd only basically played one season and a few games a year before, but he would scored 29 goals and he was getting about a 0.6 per game. Uh, point now back in that day however when we're looking at Montreal here we're looking at 34 points as a rookie we were looking at a pace of about 20 points in his second year if he had played the the full year and then in his third year here I mean he was on a 25 point game pace so you are paying a player that scores 0.3 how much money you got point one for that, a year but that's why you got this. That that they had no choice but to let him go. There's no way they're going to take up that kind of money for a player that even potentially, if he could double, he would only be at a point six point per game pace. Hundred percent. But I mean, a little bit of injury and being benched doesn't exactly, uh, or being a healthy scratch doesn't exactly bode well with you. And Montreal may not have believed in the players. That being said, Montreal was low in the middle. They've always struggled with having centers, right? They've tried a variety of things. Now, they brought in Dvorak for those picks. And actually, they paid a little bit of a premium because it's a first and a second. And it's a conditional second, I believe, uh, for Christian Dvorak because Arizona's just piling up on all their uh, draft picks, right? They have like five or six in the second round. So, you know, they really, they really want to be stable. And I like... Christian Dvorak, and I think he replaces Deneau for what he did. And I think Deneau, he's a little bit better Deneau offensively. He has a bit more upside. But he's Deneau a is a good defensive center. So Christian Dvorak is a point five. He, he's scoring half a point a game and coming in at a four, almost a four and a half million, a four, four million, four hundred. For the next five years. Yeah, for the next five years. So you're paying, you know, it's not crazy dollars. It's, it, but I mean, like, and I think, like you said, replacing Deneau, if the fans can understand, Dvorak is not your number one center. But chances are he may be played like that. And, and so fans are going to have to go easy on Dvorak because as well as he was as good as he was when he was young, he just hasn't produced. Now, it could be because he's in uh, Arizona. You know, they've been all over the place. But anyway. Well, and and, and, and it, just a quick add for Montreal. They have a lot of questions coming up next season as well because they got to re-sign Nick Suzuki, who potentially could be their top line center, right? Who could be, as people have compared him to, the next Patrice Bergeron, right? With and and he's played very well, and you know he has a lot of upside, you know. And I'm pretty sure uh, 
Vegas is kicking themselves for letting Nick Suzuki go because they could definitely use the center right now, can't they? <laughs> they're relying but, on Nolan Patrick right now to, to show up big time. I mean, but 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 they're they're going to be missing Price for a little bit at the beginning of the season. They're going to miss Weber for the whole season. You know, they've got some missing pieces that really were able to push them through in the playoffs, right? And we don't know if Shea Weber will retire or come back. Like I can't say. You know, we'll see what happens. Uh, Price, we want to make sure he's healthy and back. You know. He wasn't doing 100% the whole saga with Seattle. So Montreal definitely has a lot of lot of questions, and I'm very interested to see how they do this season. Okay, so we had a discussion offseason before Sveznikov signed and before yeah. uh, and Jess Perry uh, got this uh, yeah. offer that was put out there. You were referring to, because you were really proud of how well Carolina has handled their cap. You feel like yeah. they had good deals, or at least not bad deals. Right, they stay away from the bad deals more. So we always know there's overpayment of some sort. Um, you, 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 and I had had this discussion. I didn't feel like they were that good. You did. Uh, you know, we, you and I discussed on someone like Jordan Stahl. You know, you felt that he added not just in the points. I'm going to be fair, like you just talked about even uh, earlier when you were talking about uh, uh, who was it? It wasn't Kaprizov. You were saying on the value they add to the team on top. Oh, Deborah. Uh, Pedersen? Uh, not Pedersen. Oh, Brady Kachuk. Brady, Brady Kachuk, Kachuk. Yeah. yeah. So I think you probably have looked at Stahl in that same manner. Yeah. Now, Stahl has only been a – and just so you guys know, when I was talking to Pavel, I was just saying that I, I really don't feel like some, Carolina has been that good with their draft. For example, Tara Vainen, great deal. Guy's making five and a half million, uh, and he is almost a point-per-game player. He is a really good. I don't know how they manage that one uh, yeah. because he was looking good at coming out in Chicago. Come on, your cap's so bad. Like, Chicago gives players away, man. But, yeah, Panarin. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, like, T- Tara Vainen and Panarin. Like, I mean, could you imagine that them in Chicago right now? Oh. But anyway, Jordan Stahl, he's only ever been a 0.5 point per game player at his $6 million range for like. And, and I struggle paying six million dollars, and it's been for a while. At a time that I don't see this as a good deal, I think it's bad. He should have been around four million, maybe four and a quarter. Uh, they're they're paying someone like Needham uh, Needemeyer uh, five million dollars for a point six per game. All I can say is Edmonton, and you you should be happy because you just knew just signed for you at probably the best deal in the league. Uh, a guy that scores 0.75 is a centerman, penalty kills, power plays. He may not be a driver of his line, but the guy produces still. And I can't see that changing off. So, uh, I, I'm, in fact, if I was Nuge, I'd be quite mad I signed that deal, even though it's eight years, uh, knowing what some of these guys have been getting paid. So, But anyway, you were saying how proud you were of them. And so really besides Stahl and, and Niedemeyer, I couldn't really find you were right. But then they go and sign Sveznikov for yes. seven point seven five. Yep. I guess I Great think deal. this is this is like Kachuk. Is it a good deal? He's only been a point six eight point per game, and he's going to make almost eight million dollars. And it's all for potential. I can't see how he's ever going to be more than a point per game player, making that. And then that's if you're hoping. His sophomore, by the way, was a 0.85, which means his other years have been about a 0.6. And he went down this last year, which is a little bit of a concern. I know he had a little bit of injuries. And that drop, though, oh. So I, and, and with this new signing, so as much as you like them, Pavel, I still think that in time, every team will let you down when you think they, they're getting good deals on their contracts. I, I think there's some bad deals on that team now. And it's going to. Not- Unless, unless you're the Tampa Bay Lightning, which, you know, back-to-back have been able to sign really good players for good contracts. So I, I admitted that at the time, up until this offseason, Carolina had made some really solid moves in signings. They made some really smart things. This season, I, as I said earlier in the show, I have some questions about some of the signings they did. If you couldn't sign Nedeljkovic for the three plus million, but you brought in the other two goalies that are a little bit older, and you traded him for peanuts to uh, to Detroit, well, yeah. that that's on you, right? Like, but again, I don't know what the staff or the coaches, the staff or the 
the trainers see, right? So they may have more insight. You know, you never know. There's very intrinsic, tricky things happening around the team, and people know more than we do. We'd like to know more, so please let us know. Um, that being said, thus far, the team has been successful. They've made it to the playoffs in the last few years. They've been more competitive. You know, they've gotten the most out of them from their coach, which, again, he took a discount, which was, you know, kind of annoyed by a lot of other teams and coaches um, uh, in other markets because, you know, Rob Brindamore is worth way more than what he got, but he wanted to make sure his staff got, uh, you know, Yes. done and got contract so good for him that was his stipulation and tom dundon is a smart business player or a businessman because he has taken that team and made it into a successful earning franchise yes. we all know carolina wasn't always a big hot market but they have made it that and that is what they want to make it work so i think that they have brought in guys that are veterans strong and certainly no contract is going to age ever well lucic is a prime example <laughs> but Mr. Stahl is still effective. He yeah. played second line center minutes last season, especially in the playoffs. So he got bumped up. He wasn't producing, but he does other things. And uh, Svechnikov to be at 7.75 and have a better point per game than Brady Kachuk, like you were saying, that's a pretty good deal. Right. And especially since he has a lot of upside. Right. And again, they like their finished players they think that they gel well together. So I think Kotkaniemi is going to benefit from playing there. Tara Vinen is going to continue to tear it up, and he's not very talked about. They're yeah. going to miss Dougie Hamilton for sure. I'm hoping that Bear and D'Angelo can be a good you know, pairing there that can help out or wherever they get placed. And I think I'm excited to watch Carolina play in that division because that's going to be a tough division to compete to get into the playoffs. Well, and I, I will say, like you said, you know, uh, with losing both their goaltenders, I think the goaltender is what's going to cause them to drop. Um, their defense, it's just going to be different. D'Angelo yeah. will replace Dougie Hamilton points, as far as I'm concerned, as long yeah. as there's no off ice issues or sorry, on ice issues with the other guys. And, and let's face it, everybody deserves another chance. Oh, yeah. I that Carolina took the chance, but again, I think they want to look good as the reclamation projects because again, they, they, they know how to use the media to their benefit and to yeah. intrigue. So what will that look like if he recovers his career and becomes yeah. well, well likes again and, and goes on a path. Um, so, so I, I'm with you Sveshnikov. When we, when you make the comparison with Brady Kachuk, do I give Sveshnikov 7.75 or who, you know, has potential uh, when he's already probably scoring 20% better rate than Brady Kachuk. Uh, but then Brady Kachuk brings different elements to the game. But yeah. at eight, $8 million, and I, I actually think his camp's going after nine, nine and a half million dollars, by the way. Mm. They do an eight year. That'll be interesting. Yeah. It, also, it, if your claim to fame is fighting a Vetchkin and not wedding, that's a pretty good claim to fame. <laughs> Okay, you know what? Let's move on. We have our last session. We only got about uh, 10 minutes, guys, to talk on this one. Um, I want to talk about all these contracts. So first up, I'm, I'm going to make it known. Uh, at this point, I don't have to eat my pants, so that's good. But I will make it known on the side, Pavel and I have had discussions about what Darnell Nurse was going to come in at. Um, I didn't think he was going to make eight. Uh, when the Seth Jones contract was signed, it changed the landscape and even went higher. It has been now reported that it probably still would have been north of eight, but now it came in north of nine. So my bad. I did not see the market changing like it has. I am shocked that Edmonton values at this dollar amount. And that's what I want to talk about, not just Nurse. We're going to cover Jones, Hamilton, Nurse, McCart. Werneski and Heikman. Heiskin. Varensky and Heiskinen. Werneski. That's why I said Werneski. No. Wait, what is Ver Varensky. It's not Varensky. It's Werneski. It's W. Zach Werneski. Yeah. W. You, you, you're saying it sounds like a V? From what I've heard, it's oh, Varensky. Okay, so guys, spell it out phonically for us. You put it right there in the comments. Sometimes we suck at saying okay. So first off, Colorado, you wanted to take your Norris caliber uh, 
player in, Mr. Oh, or who are we going with? The first signing, though, that started all this was Seth Jones, was it not? Okay, it was. Okay. Well, I so, believe, so this, no, no, I believe, I believe McCarr was before. Oh, okay, I did not think McCarr came in until following up on this, but you could be right. So, again, you guys can correct us in the comments section uh, if you have the facts yourselves or pulling sure. them. Okay, let's go with Jones then. Uh, okay, so, but let's just look. So, we finished off our discussion last year. We're not going to go there today about what's going to happen in Edmonton when they brought Duncan Keith out of Chicago. What we know is Chicago wanted Caleb Jones, the brother. It was reported all over uh, so that they could bring Seth in and Seth would go play in Chicago. It worked. So they got their deal. We'll see on the Duncan thing. We'll visit that in about another month and a half. Yeah. Um, however, it changed the landscape because Jones signed in at nine and a half million dollars. Yeah. He now I went in. He is a 0.5 point per game player in his career now. Great yeah. player defensively and gives you a half point a game. Okay, now I'm I'm going to get all the numbers and then let's talk around about them all. Dougie Hamilton. Ends up signing as a UFA, a little bit older guy, uh, yeah. and he signs at nine million in New Jersey. He yeah. is a point five six, so pretty identical older player. He gets about a half million less a year. Yeah, Hale McCarr, young player, two seasons only, so he's giving up RFA years, not yeah. UFA years as much. Yeah, he signs in at. $9 million, and he scores at a rate of 0.93. Only yep. point per game player. Yep. Uh, again, though, it's very young, but it looks good. So, and how do you say Zach's name? Just for correction. Zach Varensky. Okay, so you're saying Varensky. The W sounds like a B. Okay. He signs at 9.58. He is the most expensive of all the defensemen at 0.56 points per game. This is insane. These prices are insane for what they're producing. And, and Heskinen comes in at 8.45, and he's at a 0.46 points per game. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Darnell Nurse to wrap this up. Darnell Nurse signs at 9.2 for a 0.4 points per game. Some people are getting overpaid here, Pavel. Who's a good signing? Who's not? Are they all overpriced? <laughs> so, first off, I'm never going to be upset for a player making bank. If they're going to cash in, cut in. Good for so, you. So you deserve to get every penny you do. Okay, so let's take this from um, a no, membership point of view, though. I'm, I'm getting to that. So, do I think some of these are overpays? Yes. When can we make an assessment on that? You have to give it at least the season. You can't start assessing at all. The yeah. best deal on this on this list, I would say, is Kale McCarr, just because of what he can produce. He's been a Norris caliber trophy, uh, Norris caliber player, um, defenseman for a while, and he's only going to get better. He's probably going to take over next to Adam Fox uh, over Hedman's role as being the best defenseman in the league. People can say that, right? Or top three in the league. Top now. Three. Miro Heiskanen doesn't get as much love and attention because he plays in Dallas, but I like what he brings to that team. And he often gets overshadowed because of Klingberg, who is their top defensive pair or guy. Um, and so I think Heiskanen can take that next step. And we saw that uh, two years ago when they went to the Stanley Cup final. He really played with his heart on his sleeve and he really outdid it. Is he worth it? I don't know. I think that contract will go as it will. You know, we had the whole Petrangelo situation last year. With Seth Jones, he may be a little bit overpaid, but they are paying for the potential of what he once was when he was in Columbus. He was a Norris nominee, of course. He had good numbers, but he is making the best of that situation. And so, as it stands, I think that Chicago really wanted him, and they would do whatever it takes to pay him. Columbus didn't see that. They went with Varensky, which they believed in, and good for him. But those two playing together helped to bump up Jones' numbers. Now, will Jones perform better in Chicago? That remains to be seen. I don't want to judge his contract yet because we don't know what's going to happen, right? It was the same thing with Jeff Skinner or Sergey Bobrovsky. Now yeah. it looked pretty atrocious at the time, 
<laughs> I mean, you know, they were getting good numbers in Columbus, you know, so, you know, or Skinner was in, uh, like, Carolina didn't want to pay for that, right? But, you know, he had a 40-goal season with Eichel. I mean, that was a great, great thing. And even if he didn't reach that potential, he could have still gotten around 25 to 35 goals. So I think Jones is an overpay. I think Nurse is an overpay. Um, and I wonder if some teams are just investing in certain players because they believe that's the core and they want to build around it. It's the same thing with Vancouver, with Hughes and Pedersen. That is their part of their core, right? And then you move the pieces around to see what fits and what doesn't. And I, but, I, and I think it's fair, Pavel, to say that defensemen are, because they're so hard to get, um, really good defensemen that are two-way defensemen. So yeah. getting all out offensive defensemen or a defensive offensive defensemen, because the guys that are defensive only are not going to be yeah. able to bring in more than five. If, yeah. if you're like getting 0.25 uh, points per game and under, but you're really good defensively, it's going to be a lot more difficult on that production. Um, Kale McCart, it's, it's out on his defensive abilities. I, I haven't done, maybe some of you guys have, Done a greater stuff. I like to know how good he is defensively to be signing that. He is, he is really good. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Because I, I'm hearing reports that out of uh, Tyson Berry, a lot of people wanted him out of Edmonton. Move him <laughs> on. You know, yet the guy was the number one point getter. And I'm going to guarantee he's going to make the top three point getters again this year. So uh, you, you got to look at both sides of the fence here. <laughs> Maybe Makar is better than I actually realized defensively, but I think that to see what Edmonton got on a steal, I think they got Barry on a really good deal sitting there around the 4.5. Um, Heskinen, man, I, I think that that was a good deal because his first uh, three years, year one, two, and three in his ELC, he got his full bonuses in year two and three, which was meaning that he was able to produce what he needed to and yeah. just his overall team play. So I feel like he's coming in that package like Seth Jones, but coming in at a better deal is yeah. kind of what it seems like to me. Uh, Seth Jones got paid to go somewhere. That's really what yeah. happened. He wanted, they had an ideal. Dougie Hamilton, Jersey's trying to rebuild, so they're paying extra. Uh, Kale well, McCarthy. They already have a defenseman on their payroll that's like overpaid. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think that was an overpay, but that, that's another story that we'll come back to later. We'll see. Uh, Zach, the worst overpay. and I. But I, I am going to, in defense of what you said about what they bring to the team and other elements, what Zach brings to Columbus is some stability because they're losing a lot of players. Yeah. And sometimes you overpay big time. And right now Columbus is having to overpay people because even people they've tried to keep there, Bobrovsky, Panera, and all, they just didn't want to stay. Even Foligno. Foligno didn't come back. I thought he would have returned. Yeah, yeah. Interesting enough, right? Um, so so you know what? They're they're paying for people to stay. And that's what happened with Darnell Nurse. Because yeah. they want Nurse to stay for this next run as best as they can for the big boys with McDavid and Dreisaitl and the rest of the team. They, yeah. they, they want to give it a shot and just say, let's do what we can. Um, I do want to make mention, and not, not because I'm from Edmonton, um, let's remember Edmonton, Darnell's did step up though, and Edmonton, everyone forgets, they lost their number one defenseman. Yeah. That bomb was gone. They've had yeah. to absorb a number one defenseman totally out of the picture. Yeah. If, he had stayed in this picture, they would be sitting pretty pretty right now yeah. uh, if he had been able to stay in the picture. But, you know, in this case, they pretty much have lost him, and we all believe he he probably will not come back. And if he does, it's you're looking probably because of what he's gone through, a third-line pairing at this stage just because of his health um, with it. So so you're right. It's just like, do, do you sign? It feels like Pavel, when we looked at the hurricanes and let, let's come into, we're going to, we're going to wrap up in the last couple of minutes here, everyone. Um, but I, I think what we're seeing Pavel with hurricanes and with Montreal, there's always one or two signings on every team that are massive overpays. And sometimes like McKinnon who got paid well without producing well became a steal when he became the superstar he is. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I think. Right, every, uh, you're gonna say, 
That being said, as I said earlier, I will reserve judgment on some of these contracts until next year because you have to give it at least some sample size, even one year, to know what you are getting in that player. Right? You can, yeah, you can do a trajectory of, you know, well, if they got this, this is where you expect them to be. But some people who are already saying the Seth Jones contract is like just the worst contract in the NHL, I disagree. I think uh, Jeff Skinner or Sergey Bobrovsky, those two – are competing neck and neck for the worst contract. At least Bobrovsky, as a goaltender, has a different expectation. But Jeff Skinner didn't have that many points last season. And then he was scratched, you know, and then dropped to the third or fourth line. Like, you don't do that to uh, to a player of that caliber and that, you know, that you're paying that much. So I definitely agree that there's definitely some questionable contracts. We'll wait and see what takes place. Um, we, we forget also that with Seattle coming in, there was going to be less defensemen available. And I think people are worried about what's happening, you know, because, of course, Seattle had to pick up a lot of defensemen, of which their top four is pretty solid. You have Adam Larson, Jamie Alexiak, Mark Giordano, who's going to be a big hole to fill in Calgary, because I'm definitely wanting to see what takes place there, yeah. you know. And, you know, they lost these guys who are going to be playing on another team. And so, and I think the one, the one, uh, thing that uh, Hamilton had going for him is that he was a veteran right-handed defenseman, kind of the Petrangelo of last year, just a little younger. Granted, you know, Petrangelo had a Stanley Cup with him, but he was, I think, who was most sought out and coveted. But I think the media attention turned to Jones because of what he could do because he was a little younger. But Man, so I'm thinking in the next couple of weeks, we got a lot of speculation and we need to get people's picks on how yes. – is going to shape up so you guys stay tuned we're going to be bringing a bunch of guests back that have been here previously and give us the honor maybe a few new ones we're going to have a pack show with a bunch of guests so that we can lay it out and everyone's going to throw their picks out and they're going to see what their speculation is of which divisions and which players uh, are going to be winning trophies and everything so over the next two weeks stay tuned for that as uh, we bring that to you. So, well, Pavel, man, it's been a blast being back talking hockey with you. Oh, it's been, it's been a real treat. I love it that I can argue with you and tell you that you're wrong because it's the only time I'll ever have it in my life. <laughs> like I said, it, it, it's, it's a pleasure, even though you know nothing about hockey. All oh, right, guys. zero. <laughs> in the meantime and in between time. Keep your sticks on the ice. Cheers and stay safe. Catch you later. Follow, like, and share us. We are stoked! I'm a terrible, I'm a terrible sore loser. I don't follow the rules. All the bearded guys seem to lie. There are rumors galore. I am so up and down on my emotions right now. Retain salad. Where there is smoke, there is always fire. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't do it. Been there, done that, and we'll get into it later. They know crap about hockey. Come on. Well, I laugh it off. I have no issue. Here's the thing, though. I have nothing to do. I'm okay with this deal. There was no other option. So now you have nothing. You already blew it. Win now. Win now. It paid off. I, 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 I will eat my pants. <laughs>